Hello everyone, let's take a look at Unit 1, Section 2 of AP Chemistry. And this is the section where we're going to be defining where each and every electron would live using electron configurations and so on. Now, this is a concept that we do cover in physical science and in uh, general chemistry, but let's do a little bit of a review of just kind of how the periodic table is set up because I have kind of a different way of explaining electron configurations. Um, so I just wanted to show how the periodic table will communicate that. If we look up above the first two columns, this is what I refer to as the S block, okay? And when we get over here to this side, columns uh, 13 through 18, that's going to be our P block. This transition metal section is the D block, and I always label that with a minus one. And then when we get to our lanthanoids and actinoids, this is our F block, and I label that with a minus two. Okay, we're going to go through a little bit of what that all means, but this is the basic setup um, to uh, just be recognizing on our periodic tables as we look, we can see those different uh, sections of that being communicated. Now, traditionally, um, I'll just throw this out there at the beginning traditionally what they do in gen chem or in a chemistry book is they'll show you the arrow diagram so it starts with the s's and then it goes sp and then it goes spd and then it goes sp d f now theoretically this does keep going where we go s p d f and then a g this is as new elements are being uh created and so on we're in the age of synthesizing elements and it could theoretically just keep on going but what i mean by the arrow diagram is they would say first of all we start with energy level one sub level s then we get to energy level two sub level s then we get to energy level two sub level p energy level three sub level s and sp and it just keeps on going along the way but you can see one of the issues right away with this uh with this type of technique in that you have to keep your lines extremely parallel um, and, and it does get a little bit confusing, but I've always kind of questioned that technique too, because it doesn't really relate anything back to what the periodic table already tells us. And so it's more of a visual for us if we can just follow it in these lines. Now, what we need to do is we need to um, keep in mind a couple of basic terms as we go. And with those in your notes, we see that we have an energy level or a shell. Those are the ones if we think of how in a, uh, the Bohr model of the atom, we could take a look at the energy levels or shells. And so we see the nucleus here with our protons and our neutrons, and we have an energy level, another energy level, another energy level. And so those energy levels or those shells are reflected on this side of your periodic table. So when we talk about those shells, we talk about what energy level they're going to live in. Okay, the next thing is the subshells, which is uh, the shape of those, and that's going to be those S, P, Ds, and Fs. And then we'll also be asking the question, where within that, uh, that subshell, where within that subshell, what plane of existence would that be? Now, I want to take a moment and pause there as well. I know this is a lot of stuff all at once. This is meant to be kind of a review. But if I... Uh, if I take a look at energy level or sublevel S, for example, there's going to be two electrons there. One is going to go clockwise, the other is going to go counterclockwise. They're going to be paired up. There's only two. But when we get over to P, there's actually six columns there. And so the question is, how do you get six things that don't get along because they're all negative, they repel one another, how do you get them to actually coexist within one general subshell or subarea? And the answer is quite simple. You put them on three different planes. You put them on an X, a Y, and a Z axis. Now, electrons, once again, they don't, they repel one another, they don't get along, so they're going to spread out as much as possible. We'll put one on one plane, maybe that's the x-axis, then the y-axis, then the z-axis, and then they'll have to pair up. And so four, five, and six. So now you see where this orbital comes in as well. We're talking about which, um, within the sublevel of sublevel P, we see we have three different orbitals that's going to be there. Now, the question becomes even more complex when we get to our Ds. You see that we have 10 columns in there. So our Ds are going to have one, two, three, four, five different planes because we have 10 total electrons. We can split them up as far as possible onto different planes. So we're talking X, Y, Z axis, and then we're go going into angled axes as well, and then they'll pair up. If the first one is going clockwise, going up, 
The second will go counterclockwise. Now, this is a much thicker shell. And that will come into play as we get into the numbering system, which I'll show you later. A thicker shell means that there's a, a, there's space uh, in between those because we've got all these different axes to account for. Now, the last one is going to be this F sublevel. If you count them up, that starts with lanthanum and it ends with the ytterbium. This actually begins the Ds. That's always tricky for people. This begins the Ds. These guys belong right up in here. All right, so my F, there's 14 of them, starting with lanthanum, ending with ytterbium. So that means we have seven pairs, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so that we can see the different uh, orbitals or um, positions within that subshell that these could all exist. All right, so that's just kind of giving us the basic foundations of things. And let's take a look at um, how the electron configurations can be made for the following atoms. All right, well, I'm going to take these in turn, and once again, let's go back to um, some of our foundational things. Uh, here's my S block, here's my P block, here's my D block that I said is a minus one, and here's my F block that's a minus two. All right, so we're finding potassium. The first thing that we're going to be including in the electron configuration is what shell does it belong to? Now, we're accounting for all electrons here, so let's start from the very beginning. The very first electron in potassium, because there are going to be uh, 19 total electrons, because there's 19 total protons in there, and it's the stable atom, not ion, it's the stable atom, so the first electron belongs in energy level 1. It belongs in the S shell. And so the first electron is here, but there will be a second electron right here, and that's where helium comes in. Um, energy level one can only hold two electrons, so there's two electrons that can be found there. Then we keep going and add a third electron. Well, that's now down in energy level two, or out in, I should say, not down. But we're energy level two, and there's two electrons there. I built my way to beryllium. Now, I keep on following straight over, and I'm still in energy level 2, but now I'm in the P sublevel, or subshell. And I can see that I have six total electrons there, and I build my way, one, two, three, four, five, six. I built my way out to neon. So now the next energy level that I find myself in is energy level 3. Sublevel S, and there's two electrons there. I follow straight across, now I'm to aluminum, that's energy level 3 still, sublevel P, and I build my way out to argon. And then the last electron for uh, completing out potassium would be energy level 4, sublevel S, and there's one electron. That's the full electron configuration for potassium. Now let's take a look at tin. Tin is a little bit more complex, okay, it's a little bit further out, and we see that we have to go through our transition metals with all of this. So it's a little bit more complex here, and we want to make sure um, we account for every single electron within that element. And we have 50 total electrons to work with. All right. So it starts in energy level 1, sublevel S. There's two electrons. Energy level 2, sublevel S. Energy level 2, sublevel P. Energy level 3, sublevel S. Energy level 3, sublevel P. Notice we're still um, following the same patterns. We're all the way out to argon now. Now we're to energy level 4. This is where we left off. So we had 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. We're to calcium. And now we're to the D. Now remember, that's a really thick uh, uh, orbital, or subshell, I should say, because there's so many different planes there. And so thick that, in fact, the 4s, which has only two electrons, occurs first. Then we hit scandium. This is actually part of the 3D sublevel. And that's why I've got the minus one as just a reminder that the 4S fills before the 3D because the 3D is so thick. So scandium all the way out to zinc. There's 10 total electrons there. And now we're back up to gallium, which is energy level four sublevel P. And we build our way out. There's six electrons. We're to krypton. Now we're down to energy level five. Sublevel S, oh, we hit the D block again. And remember, the D block is one less the energy level because of that thickness, that overlap. So this is the 4D sublevel. And there are 10 electrons there. And I work my way over to indium. This is my 5P. And there's only two electrons to account for there. Okay? So that's kind of building up this uh, direction with it.
Now, we're going to let me label these up as a reminder, a visual again. Here's my D, a minus 1, and here's my F, a minus 2. All right. So to this point, we've been doing the theoretical parts, and those are going to be the off-bow uh, rules that we follow with it. There are exceptions to the rules, and this is going to be the, the frustrating part in all of chemistry. For every rule, there's going to be an exception. So this is why we have chromium in place. We're building to this element right here. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. 4s2 fills, then we go 3d4. This is what we would expect. Okay, that's the off-bow principle, A-U-F-B-A-U. -A so that's just how this will fill, but there are exceptions to the rule. So let's look at this orbital one more time, one, two, three, four, five. There are four total electrons here, and in the preceding, here's my 4s, there were two electrons here. This is my 3d, and we have one, two, three, four. Four. Now, well, there is a rule that states that the first one is going to be going up, which is clockwise. When it pairs up, it'll go counterclockwise. Now, here's the exception. The exception is saying that it is actually more thermodynamically favorable. It's more stable if we have half full orbitals or completely full orbitals. Now, the 4s2 is completely full. Okay, very favorable. But my d is just one shy of half full. Remember, D can hold 10 total. If I could get one more electron in here, right here, then I'd be half full, and that would be thermodynamically stable. So what's going to happen is an electron from the S is going to strip out of the S to half fill S so we can half fill D. So the result, the exception, would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, nothing's changed, but here's the exception to the rule of the off-bow principle. There's the exception. Now, that's the column. Everything in this column is going to be doing that. There are exceptions all over the place. The next exception we'd find within silver. Okay, notice, again, the full electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, making our way out there, 5s2, 4d9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now they pair up 6, 7, 8, 9. Here's my 5s, 1 and 2. Here's my 4d. Okay, now that's the general, uh, the immediate one. There are exceptions to this, and you can see what the scenario is. A full sublevel is more stable, more uh, thermodynamically favorable than being just short of that. So we're going to take one of these away. We're going to make a 5S1. That half fills the S which is pretty stable, and the reason it's going to happen is because we can completely fill the D then. So everything else in here is the same, um, it's just getting into the uh, filling of those sublevels. So those are exceptions to the rule. Now the last one, if we take a look at, um, at this, we're going to end up with palladium, okay, and that is atomic number 46. And the reason we've got this one in here is uh, we want to make sure we can just see some exceptions to this one too. I said half full and so on. If the question is asking for the full electron configuration, we're here. And so we go, what everybody's familiar with now, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, then we go 5s2, 4d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the question is, is if they are asking for the exception to the rule, we're going to completely strip all of the S's away. Because the overlap, they're closely associated, we're going to end up with a 5s0, 4d10. Now, you would, might ask, well, why would S do that? It, again, it's just thermodynamically um, favorable in that way. And 
quite honestly, if they're just asking for the exceptions to the rule, you can see where that comes from. Okay, so I wouldn't expect you to just intuitively know that would happen. You'd have to be prompted for some type of um, some type of actual exception to uh, get to that level. All right, now let's take a look at ions. Okay, ions are going to be slightly different with there, but they are based on the same premise. Now remember, to this point, I've been describing just atoms. So the number of protons equals the number of electrons. But if I take a look at calcium, calcium does, as an atom, have 20 protons. Okay, that means that the stable atom is going to have 20 electrons. Okay, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. All right, but the question is the ion of calcium. Well, calcium is in column two. That means that if I get rid of two electrons, I collapse back down to my column 18 that's covered up by the mouse there. So if, if I do that, I lose two electrons. So the calcium ion, if you lose two negative things, you become a positive two charge. How did I do that? I lost two uh, uh, electrons. Where are those electrons? Right here. So the calcium ion would have the exact same electron configuration, because remember, this is just describing where electrons live. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. It's going to have the exact same electron configuration as those elements that are found in the noble gases. In this case, it'd have the same electron configuration as argon. If I take a look at selenium, Okay, selenium is going to be right here, and so what we see is it's going to gain, it has a 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p, 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, how many more electrons does it need? It needs two more electrons, 1, 2, to become thermodynamically favorable. So I'm going to add two electrons here. And so selenium has a negative two charge. And we're going to have the exact same electron configuration as krypton. OK, pretty simple. I take a look at aluminum. And so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1 originally. All right, so what's easier? What's more favorable to lose three electrons or to gain one, two, three, four, five electrons. It's much easier to lose three electrons there um, to form the aluminum ion. There are other ways to get a, uh, an ion in there. So you might have other, um, other ways to accomplish that. But the question is, how do I communicate? I'm talking about in any of these. I'm talking about the ion. I'm not talking about the element, okay? So I just crossed them out here because this is the element. What you would do for the ion then is just leave those as zeros. 3s0, 3p0. And so that tells us that they were actually stripped of those electrons. And so that's how you tell the difference. Last one is going to be taking a look at chlorine. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3 P5. That's the atom, and so we would go 3P6 to form the ion. Okay, so pretty straightforward with those. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's pretty easy once you just get used to the patterns of how to write electron configurations. Now, next step of this, and I've already primed you for this when we get into the concept of quantum numbers. Quantum numbers is a, a numbering system to actually identify any particular electron. And it's based off of what we've already done. Quantum numbers seems like it's hard, but it's actually kind of a simple concept if you keep these things in mind. First set of numbers with our quantum numbers. First set of numbers tells us what shell we're in, what energy level. So it's energy level one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. The second number um, within quantum number sets is identifying its subshell. So I'm talking about, is it an S, is it in a P, a D, or an F? Well, the reality is we can't just say SPD or F. We have a numbering system, so we number those sublevels. 
okay? To number the sublevels, we have a code. And so the code you need to remember is the SPDF. In fact, I've got that on the next one. Um, the, SP, uh, the SPDF is just a simple way to remember, uh, first of all, that you gotta study. But second of all, that the S is a zero value, the P is a one, a D is a two, and an F is a three. So it's just a code is all we're doing. So first number is going to be our energy level. Second number that in a quantum number is going to be our sub level. And then we're going to be identifying which orbital that electron lives in. Now, that's why I did orbital diagrams with you um, to show you those values. Now, this looks confusing at first. It looks confusing to process, but it's actually quite simple. If you think of uh, what I showed you before about orbitals, S can hold two total electrons, so that means it's one pair. P can hold six total, so I have one, two, three. I said that they live on different axes, like an X, Y, Z axis. And so we see that the P has three orbitals. And this is going to tell us our M value, our magnetic spin. Now, we number these orbitals always with the middle number being zero. So we number out as a one, we number back as a negative one. S, middle number is always zero. When we get to a D, remember there's 10 total uh, columns, so that's five pair. One, two, three, four, five. Middle number is going to be zero, one, two, negative one, negative two. And then our F holds 14, which is seven pair, four, five, six, seven. Middle number is zero, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. Okay, so that's where these numbers come from, and it's just identifying which particular sublevel that electron might live in. Okay, so it's actually quite simple once you draw it out, and that's gonna be your key. Now, the last one is simply just indicating, is that arrow going up or is it going down? And that's going to be the spin. If it's a positive one half, that means it's going clockwise. If it's a negative one half, it's going counterclockwise. Okay, now remember, and, and why we need to know all of this is um, to describe where electrons live, what's going to be going on with those electrons, because that's where chemistry happens. And we do need to keep in mind what I've been showing you along the way, that we do not pair up our electrons until we have to. That is going to have its own set of unique numbers now. And remember how they pair up. The Pauli exclusion principle states that they will fill different orbitals uh, until they can't anymore, and then they will pair up. So let's take a look at how bromine works. Uh, atomic number 35 is just 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p5. The reality is, if I was going to draw out all of those orbitals, we can see all the electrons in there, and there's a lot to process within this graphic. We're showing all the electrons in there, and I can describe any particular electron. So let's do that. Let's, let's identify um, the, the quantum numbers for three different electrons in here. And what's key is to remember how these things are going to fill. So let's start with electron labeled at, a number, at letter A. We see that the first number is the quantum number that tells me the energy level. Remember our speed EF. The second number is going to be our, our sublevel code, and the code for an S is a zero. S is zero, P is one, D is two, F is three. All right, so that's that. Now I see that S sublevel has only one orbital, and so we number the middle orbital as a zero, and the last number is going to be its spin. Notice that the second electron is circled here, and so it's going down. It's negative one half. All right, so let's take a look at letter B. We see that its electron is in the third energy level. It's in the D. Remember, this is zero, one, two, three. So it's in the second sublevel. We number our orbitals. Here's my zero, one, two. Here's my negative one, here's my negative two. We find that electron in B is in the negative one orbital and it's going down, so it's a negative one half. Cool, so that's that set of uh, quantum numbers. Lastly, we're gonna look at this electron. This is what we've been building toward all along. We see that uh, it's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, we've got five total electrons, but I'm describing the third electron there, okay? 
So it's energy level 4, sublevel 1, which is a P. It's in the first orbital. Remember, middle number is always 0. There's 1, there's negative 1. And it's going clockwise. Now, remember what I just said. That's the third electron. So I can flip this process. I could make up something just on the fly, and I could say, all right, I'm thinking of an electron. And it is a 5, a 2, a negative 1, and a uh, negative one half. Which electron is that? Now the key to this is to identify first off that this is describing a D. So I'm going to draw out my orbitals. I'm going to number them up. And I'm going to add my electrons until this orbital right here gets its second electron. So I've gone one, two, three, four, five, six and seven okay so this is a 5d7 electron so working that all in reverse that's how the quantum numbers work okay now next page of your notes we see that you need to do the quantum numbers for all the electrons in the neon atom now that seems like it'd be really intimidating it seems like it's going to be a lot of work until we think of how we could organize this to track every single electron. Rather than do them linear like this, and I was taking it easy on you because we only have um, just a few electrons in uh, neon. There's only 10 total electrons to account for. Rather than do them linear, let's do them going down. I can track the two electrons in the 1s. I can track the two electrons in the 2s. And then we could track the two electrons in, or sorry, the six electrons in the 2p. Remember, we're tracking our n, our l, our m, and our s values. Now we can see the pattern start to emerge. The first electron in neon is going to be in energy level 1. It's going to be in sublevel s. The orbital for s is always a 0. The first one is going clockwise. The second electron is energy level 1, sublevel S, the zero orbital, and it's going counterclockwise. The third electron is in energy level 2, sublevel S, zero orbital, it is going clockwise. The second electron, energy level 2, sublevel S, the zero orbital, and negative one half. Now we get to energy level 2, sublevel P. Okay, so we've taken care of four electrons, energy level 2, sublevel p and now let's remember how uh, the p works one two three zero one and negative one that first electron goes into the negative one orbital doesn't it and it's going to go positive it's going to go clockwise the second electron is going to go right here energy level two sublevel p the zero orbital and it's going clockwise the third electron energy level two sublevel p the one orbital and it's going clockwise the third electron or fourth electron in the p is energy level two sublevel p we're back into our negative one uh, sub uh, orbital here and it's going counterclockwise now because it's paired up energy level two sublevel p the zero orbital and it's going counterclockwise energy level two sublevel p the one orbital and it's going counterclockwise so it's not as tricky as you might think, as long as you slow down and label up your, uh, your different orbitals along the way. Just track them and you'll be fine, okay? Now, you do have a problem set that goes with this and uh, it'd be spending a lot of time dealing with electron configurations. Be patient, talking about the electron configurations um, for ions as well. We're gonna be taking a look, uh, then mapping out where those electrons live within the photoelectric spectrum, okay, it's, it's the same concept, energy being handed out there. We'll see also with the NIMSI handout, we'll be doing some practice problems, bringing in the wavelengths as well. So we're tying in the electrons, where they live, and the amount of energy that they're going to be storing. Okay, our next video is talking about periodicity and trends that we've, other trends that we find in the periodic table. So good luck to you guys, and we'll check in with you on the next video.